Hello, my name is Jason Wong. I'm a senior here at Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School in the MSTC program, and I would like to welcome you to my virtual symposium presentation. The title of my project is Using Binary Quadratic Forms to Determine Which Versions of the Modified Pell Equation Are Solvable. I conducted this research under the mentorship of Dr. Avinash Sate at the Department of Mathematics in the University of Kentucky. So a quick overview of my project. First, I am going to introduce the uh, topic of my presentation and then provide an algorithm that I use to make the determinations of whether the equations are solvable. Then I will go through my goal and the math to accompany it, after which I will discuss the results and conclusions of my current research as well as steps for future research. And I would like to end with a few acknowledgments uh, the references for my project and open my email to any questions you guys may have. So first, an introduction to the modified Pell equation. The modified Pell equation takes this form right here where D and C are given integers that determine a specific version of the equation. And if the solution X, Y to uh, satisfy the equation exists, we say that D represents C. So a quick example, the equation x squared minus 2y squared equals 1 is solvable, so 2 represents 1, but the equation x squared minus 2y squared equals 3 is not solvable for the integers x and y. So we say that 2 does not represent 3, and the goal of my project is, determine, is to determine why these relationships do or do not occur. And to, to answer this question, I use uh, binary quadratic forms which are three numbers that represent this multivariable function right here. A characteristic of the binary quadratic form is the determinant value here, b squared minus ac. In the Pell equation, uh, x squared minus dy squared is a quadratic form 1, 0, negative d. So the determinant is d uh, for a version of the Pell equation. And if d represents c, it follows this same um, definition here of representation. So if there exists a solution, then the form represents M, or um, in my case, D represents C. So there are an infinite number of quadratic forms that all have the same determinant, same beginning numbers. So there is uh, a better way, we need a better way to talk about these quadratic forms. And the way we do that is with the Bhaskara reduced forms, which provide an easy way to compare these forms. So a uh, form is Bhaskara reduced if it satisfies uh, these two conditions right here. These, these uh, conditions are actually equivalent to each other. You would obtain the second one by squaring the first one. And notice that um, the equality here is non, or the inequality here is non-strict. A form is flexible if it satisfies this equals part of the condition. So operations on quadratic forms, uh, two forms are considered equivalent if they represent the same set of integers through uh, some form of transformation. And you determine if two forms are equivalent by using a method called cycling, uh, which produces successive equivalent forms. So uh, if you look at this example here, you start off with the form 183, and to find a form that is um, equivalent, you select a number here such that this number plus this number is a multiple of uh, this number. So eight plus seven here is a multiple of three, which makes this a valid uh, successor. And then you calculate this last value using the determinant. So you set seven squared minus three times this number equal to the determinant 61, and that shows that this form is uh, equivalent to this form. And so a few things to note are that there are an infinite number of choices for, for this number here, as long as it satisfies that this plus this is a multiple of this. But we want to choose the number here to minimize the magnitude of this number. And that's important to satisfy the um, Bhaskara or reduced conditions mentioned on the previous slide. So to answer our question, if D represents C, uh, I've uh, taken an algorithm 
from previous research. So first you create a form here, C comma uh, L sub R comma on where these last two numbers are just forms that are just numbers that fill out the form to satisfy the determinant value. Now this form may or may not exist. If it does not exist, then clearly this equation is not solvable and does not represent C. But if this form does exist, you have to determine if this form and the form one zero negative D are equivalent. And in order to do that, you first cycle uh, from both of these forms until the form is reduced and then you continue cycling to determine if these two forms are equivalent or not. And so this graphic here is a quick summary of what it means if the forms are equivalent. So if they are equivalent, then the equation is solvable and D represents C. If this form, if these forms are not equivalent, uh, then the equation is unsolvable. Uh, so here's a quick example. I have the equation x squared minus 13 y squared equals 17, and it is solvable. I found a solution right here. And so uh, an example of how the algorithm works, first you take the form one zero negative D here, and you cycle until it is reduced. This form right here satisfies the reduction conditions. And then you take a form that begins with 17 and then satisfies the determinant, and you reduce it until this form here, which satisfies the reduced conditions, and then you continue cycling until you find a, um, a form here that is the reduced version of this form. And since these two forms are both equivalent to each other, this equation is solvable as indicated by the solution right here. So the overall goal is to prove that this algorithm always uh, produces the correct determination and in order to do that, we just have to prove that if forms are equivalent, they cycle to each other. And if forms cycle to each other, they must be equivalent. So the problem that we could run in here is if you have cycled from one form and have not reached the other form, how do you know when to stop? Because if you stop too soon, the forms might be equivalent, but you would not have determined that. And if the forms are not equivalent and you keep cycling, you would go on forever and never reach the other form. So uh, to kind of resolve this, it is suggested that these forms of these equivalent forms of the same determinants group into nice cycle circular patterns. And if you've determined the entire cycle, then you can tell for sure if two forms are equivalent or if they aren't. So in order to do this, uh, the first step is to revise some of the Bhaskara reduced conditions. So originally, um, in the slide previous, I had shown there were two, um, two sets of conditions with two, uh, two conditions each. And here I've reduced it down to one condition based on a comparison between A and C. So if, for example, A is greater than C and this condition holds, then the other condition that must hold follows, follows naturally. And so this is the only condition we actually have to prove and check. And it just makes things a little simpler to, to prove. The next uh, important idea is that uh, Bhaskara forms, if there's a Bhaskara form that you, that you can cycle to, then it is definitely unique. So of all of the possible choices a form F can cycle to, either none of them are Bhaskara, one of them are Bas is Bhaskara, or the pesky case here, two of them are flexible. And that is something we need to deal with, and I will uh, explain that shortly. So a quick example to make this concrete. If you have a form 3, 4, negative 1, then your next form could equal any of these forms because they all satisfy the condition that the middle value here plus 4 is a multiple 1. Uh, clearly any of these or these middle values can be any any number at all. And then this last value here is just um, used to satisfy the determinant. And uh, of all of these possible condition, uh, continuations, I have bolded the one here that is that satisfies the Bhaskara forms and clearly that is the one we want to choose because we like Bhaskara. So to deal with the uh, pesky case where there are two flexible continuations, I have there are two choices that this form could cycle to. 
both of which satisfy this reduction condition, uh, the Bhaskara conditions with the equal sign. They're both flexible. And notice this only occurs when the last value that is solved for is equal in magnitude and opposite in sign. But what's important to notice here is that after cycling uh, twice more, both choices result in the same in the same form, which means that the choice between these two in the end doesn't really matter. And so we can just arbitrarily pick the one with, um, we can arbitrarily pick either one. Here I have chosen to pick the form with the smaller middle value at first and I've bolded it. So a couple things to note about these flexible continuations, those flexible forms either come in pairs or compose the entire cycle, like I've shown in the uh, previous slide. Each of these has, once you choose a flexible form, there is another flexible form that follows before you go back into non-flexible forms. Um, here is another example. And the other possibility is that the entire cycle of forms are um, all flexible. And that only occurs when the, you have a two in each form, so you have two something something and then something, something, negative two. So this um, absolute value two shows up in every single form. And that means that the uh, cycle is always going to have flexible forms. And the final important thing is that about these flexible forms is that even if two forms can continue the cycle, either choice always leads to the exact same cycle like I've shown in this example right here. I've taken two different paths, but they all, uh, in the end, result in the same forms. And so what that really means is that we can just completely ignore these flexible cases and treat them with an arbitrary, we can take an arbitrary choice and treat it like it's the only choice and merge it into the same case as those continuations where only one form is Bhaskara. And so now to the um, really important parts to prove that these forms belong into cycles. First, uh, it must be shown that if this was not true, then there would be really no point in discussing reduced forms at all. So what this means is if you take one form and you cycle continuously, eventually you will lead to a reduced form, which in our algorithm means that once you have reached that reduced form, you can begin there and cycle to see if it is equivalent to the other form. The proof of this theorem is divided into three different cases uh, with the conditions shown here and an example of each case shown here. I did not provide the full proof because that takes up, um, takes up a lot of space and time if you want to know the full proof, please feel free to email me. Or, yeah. um, the other important thing about these Bhaskara forms is that once you have reached a Bhaskara form, if you cycle from that form, it always leads to another Bhaskara reduced form. If you choose the, um, the form that What this means is that once you have reached the Bhaskara forms and you continue cycling, you will always be dealing with Bhaskara forms, which is very nice. So you can always take any forms, reduce them, and then continue from there to determine if they're equivalent instead of worrying about non-Bhaskara forms being mixed in. This proof is split into six cases, uh, the first three of which are shown on this slide. The conditions are on the left and an example of the form satisfying the condition is on the right. Again, I don't have the full proof, but if you want that, please feel free to email me. Um, here is the the last three click the last three cases. So the last two cases are proven uh, in previous research, uh, but the first four are left kind of open. He claims they're trivial, but uh, they weren't very trivial to me. So I went ahead and, for the sake of completion, proved them. And so uh, we're winding down here to the towards the end. Bascara forms 
follow a strict order. So each form precedes and follows a unique mascara form. This is due to a combination of the fact that the form that follows the mascara form must be mascara, and that if it is mascara, the um, form choice must be unique. So each of these uh, forms, when you cycle between them, they follow a very strict pattern. And when you combine that fact with the fact that there are a finite number of mascara forms that must uh, eventually have some kind of repeat because there are only a certain number of forms that are reduced and can satisfy the determinant, they must follow a very strict order and repeat in a circular pattern, which is a cycle. So now that uh, I've proven that this cycle must exist, we can easily determine if two forms are equivalent or not using the cycling method by reducing them, finding the entire cycle, and seeing if the other form, when reduced, belongs into that cycle. And this also uh, puts an end to the problem of having to uh, cycle forever because you'll never have to cycle forever to um, make the determination if two forms are equivalent or not because they will fall into um, circular patterns. So in conclusion, this algorithm does always correctly determine if a version of the equation is solvable because forms are equivalent or not. And the next step of my research is maybe using this algorithm, maybe not, be able to compute values of B and C that form a solvable equation without having to run this algorithm every time um, to make that determination. So like using some kind of algebraic computation method to just generate values of D that represent C or generate values of C that are represented by a certain D. So uh, I couldn't have done this project alone. Acknowledgements to all of those that have helped me. I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Avinash Sate, for working with me on this project. Of course, I couldn't have done it without him. And I couldn't have done this project without the University of Kentucky or the Kentucky Young Researchers Program. The Math Science and Technology Center, and especially Ms. Young, for helping me through this uh, process, giving me the opportunity to do research and encouraging me to do my best through, through, throughout this entire process. And finally, I would like to thank my friends and family uh, for the endless support that they provided me throughout uh, this research project. And of course, I would like to thank all of you guys for tuning into my uh, virtual presentation. It really means a lot, means a lot to me. Of course, uh, I didn't pull all this math out of nowhere. I did uh, <laughs> cite some previous research in, in my work. So here are my references. And finally, I'd like to open my email to any questions you guys have. Please feel free to please feel free to email me. I would love to talk more about this with you guys. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you for coming to my presentation. And I hope you guys all have a nice day.